my name is pronounced Matan, sort of like a mitt, like a glove, and then tan like you get outside in the sun. Um, as far as my background, so I have a background in electrical engineering from here at Penn State. I uh, got that in 2004 and then went on uh, to get my uh, systems engineering degree from Cornell University. I uh, did that while working for Lockheed Martin. So I uh, spent a little over 15 years working for Lockheed out of their uh, rotary emission system business in upstate New York. Uh, primarily working on this aircraft here or variants of it. So if uh, anyone, rec anyone recognize what aircraft that is? I see maybe a couple head nods. I'm staying on that side in that light. So that's an NMH-60 Sierra helicopter. So that's uh, a derivative of a helicopter we use for the Navy that we were using for airborne mine countermeasures. So basically looking for uh, mines underwater. So I worked on that platform as a systems engineer, as a software engineer. Uh, and then eventually went into product development where I got to work on all of the avionics processors and computers that went into uh, both that one and then also variants of that called the MH-60 Romeo helicopter which was used to hunt for uh, submarines. Um, let's see, outside of that I have a few other hobbies. So uh, I see we, we've cleared some space over here for push-ups for our activities for later today. So I appreciate that. So I am a martial artist, I've been doing that for a little over 30 years. Uh, in fact, actually, before I moved back here to, uh, to Penn State, uh, my wife and I owned a martial arts studio. So it was a studio I grew up in. Uh, ran that studio as kind of a, our side business in the evenings when we weren't doing engineering or my wife uh, is a human development graduate, so she worked in social services. And then, of course, we like doing a lot of things in, uh, outside of that. These are our, our boys, Roman and Deacon, like you know, home projects, camping, that kind of thing. So that's my background. All right, so let's talk a little bit about project management and what is project management. Um, anyone ever heard of what we call the Iron Triangle? Some people call it the Iron Triangle. Oh, good. All right. This is the Iron Triangle. Uh, lots of different variations of kind of what these, these terms are, but they generally mean the same thing, right? Sometimes you might see technical with a different term like quality or something like that. But essentially, when you think about project management, we are thinking about how we manage these three core things within a project, right? So if you think about the things you've worked on before, technical might be things like scope, right? How many cool widgets do we want to put in? What are the requirements? What do our customers really want from us? Then we take that scope and we apply some cost to it, right? More widgets means more, more cost, right? We add more cost and more widgets. That generally means more schedule, right? When we work on projects, it's our job as project managers and as engineers to understand how do those projects apply to what our customer really wants, right? And which one of these areas are things that are most important to our customer? You might have a customer that says, I really want all the widgets in the world, but it can't be any more than a million bucks. Or they might say, cost is nothing to me. I really want all the widgets in the world, right? And so then you're responsible for managing in here or maybe in schedule or whatever. What we're gonna focus on today is when we think about the role of a project manager. And generally speaking, the role of the project manager is to focus in these two areas. Right now, we can make an argument, and certainly we teach this in our engineering leadership program about you know, how it's important for engineers, both as individual contributors and as leaders of, of teams, to really balance between all three of these. But oftentimes, when you start to really develop your team, your project manager ends up having the core responsibilities for your cost and your schedule, while your technical team is responsible for meeting all of your technical objectives whatever you've committed to do for your customer. Outside of that, we now talk about the engineering design process. Anyone ever seen a chart that looks similar to this? Yeah, we're getting somewhere. All right, this is great. So the engineering design process, and there's lots of, again, different variations of this. This kind of goes back to maybe a little bit more of my legacy of what we would traditionally call the waterfall, right? And they call it the waterfall because of the way it kind of looks like a waterfall. Although, in a typical waterfall, you don't necessarily see this, right? This is more of a new derivation of, of that process, and it comes out of the idea that we can't necessarily just go linearly through this path because what ends up happening is we get to the end and we discover that maybe what we did is not necessarily what we intended to do. Anyone ever heard the terms verification or validation? I've seen those. Who thinks they can tell me the difference between them? I don't think I remember correctly. So Validation, uh, wait, verification is checking if, um, oh no, not blanking. Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. That's right, another one, yeah. Verification is that works, and 
validation is that someone told you, oh, that it's okay, that works for me. Ah, yes, exactly. My first time anyone's ever gotten this correct. So verification is basically meeting requirements, right? It's a matter of you list out your requirements and you check them off, pass, fail. All right, my favorite example of this is someone says they want something that's portable. And I design something and I say, if it's in the back of my pickup truck, it's portable, pass. I go to deliver that to my customer and my customer looks at it and says, I really need to walk it from this side of campus to that side of campus. It's not portable. They say it fails, right? From a verification standpoint, I verified that I met that requirement of it is portable, but it did not meet my customer's intent of being able to walk it across campus. Excellent job, well done. All right, so what was happening in traditional waterfall is exactly what we just described. All that wasn't happening with little widgets that we're building, it was happening with multi-million dollar and multi-year projects. And so that's where you started to see these different types of things coming in where we talk about this iterative process. The iterative process of let's not just sit down and just do requirements, design, development, and test in one serial fashion, but let's do it as rapidly as we can, understanding what are those most important requirements, the things that we mostly don't understand, like the highest risk items, develop them and then show them to our sponsors or our customers and make sure that they are happy with what we're delivering before we get to the final test uh, integration and then delivery. Everyone following me so far? Okay, this is where project management really meets the road, right? When we think about engineers on a typical team, a lot of times our typical engineers will be heads down thinking about their core discipline. I'm the software engineer, I gotta get my code written, I gotta get it compiled, I gotta get it debugged. I'm the electrical engineer, I gotta figure out my schematics, I gotta figure out how I'm gonna lay out my circuit card, I gotta figure out the layer assembly. Right, I'm the mechanical engineer, I gotta figure out all the thermal requirements, right? What's my box gonna look like? How am I gonna dissipate heat? Right, all of these things become core responsibilities for your individual contributors on the team. And if there's nobody else looking at these types of things to make sure that your customer's getting what they want, that results in failure, okay? When you think about um, project management as a process, you can break it down, and this is something if you're ever really curious about it, you can go out and pull this right off of LinkedIn Learning. There's some really cool modules that kind of break it down into basically generating your plan, defining what your project is, and then executing it. And what does it mean to execute that project? So we'll talk a little bit about, real quickly, the plan, right? So we talk about generating our plan. Typically, once we know our requirements, everything starts with the requirements, we then go into what we would call, in a traditional sense, the work breakdown structure. Anyone ever heard of this term? No, a little bit, some, okay. So the work breakdown structure is what we call our WBS. And that WBS is almost like your to-do list. It's like taking your list of things that you need to do and just listing them all out by discipline or by whatever. Um, another way to think of it is I, I like to tell people, it kind of reminds me of almost like a file folder structure, right? You've got a 1.0 and a 2.0 and a 3.0 and then you can break that down into a 1.1 or, or whatever as you kind of uh, de derive things or kind of break your tasks into more manageable chunks that you can actually go execute. Once you have a work breakdown structure, you generally know what you have to do. After the what comes the three word, anyone, three letter? Oh, well, not almost why. <laughs> Starts with an H. How? 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 Yeah, you're close. The how. All right, so how am I going to do this? So I know what I'm going to do, but now how? That's where we go when we generate. Anyone ever heard of this word? It's kind of weird. Some people don't see it until like later. And yeah, so now we're seeing lots more head knots. The Gantt chart. Right? The Gantt chart is sort of the fancy way of saying your schedule. Right? Now there's a lot of stuff that goes into a Gantt chart. Right? But if you were to really just take it at the simplest level, right, we think of the Gantt chart as taking your WBS laying out all your tasks, and now you're time phasing them. You're laying them out over time, and you're trying to figure out what comes first, what are, what's dependent on what, who's gonna do it, and when does it have to get done. This is where your projects all start to come together, okay? Now, a key thing to remember when we think about Gantt charts or any sort of schedule is that duration does not equal effort. This is an important thing that a lot of people mess up. If I look at especially even projects that students work on, right? one of the challenges that students have with projects is that they try to uh, equate duration with effort. 
So what do I mean by that? Can anyone think of a, of a, a difference between duration and effort? Any guesses? I'll give you an example. Oh yeah, I got a guess. Duration is how long you're, you're doing something and effort is how much you're putting into it. Exactly right. Duration is how long something is and effort is how much you're going to put into it. I'll give you an example. I have to write a paper. I tell you that it's a three-page paper and you have to answer one question. Okay? Three-page paper, one question. You're all starting to, your gears are starting to turn, right? I tell you that paper is due next Friday. How long is it going to take to do? When do you start it? Anyone? Who's the procrastinator in the room? Like, I'll start third. Yeah. The Thursday before. The Thursday before. All right. So your your duration is one day, maybe two, right? If it's if it's Friday midnight, we'll give you two days, right? How many hours are you going to put into writing that paper? Four or five. Okay, but two days is forty-eight hours. Yeah. Okay. So you're putting in four to five hours of effort, right? This is the difference between. Uh, typically just trying to do projects and then thinking about projects from a project management standpoint. A lot of people don't realize that they're already doing project management and they haven't actually put the two together and say, oh, I'm already doing this kind of stuff, right? You know you can write that paper in four hours or five hours and you're going to wait till Thursday to do it, right? But why Thursday? Well, because, you know, some of you, I was waiting for someone to say Friday, right? Thursday, because, well, maybe you want a night to sleep on it, right? You're going to take that four or five hours. You're going to hammer through three hours. You're going to get the majority of it done. You're going to go to bed, wake up in the morning, give it one last proofread, looks good, submit, right? That is the difference between duration and effort. Effort is basically the number of hours you're putting into something, right? We often neglect effort when we're students because we're not necessarily thinking about it in terms of dollars. So when I think of effort here now in real project management, that's dollars, Right? That's money that you're paying engineers or, or people on your project team to do your project. So the more people you put on it, the more it costs, et cetera. Now you see the iron triangle starting to come together. Okay. When we start laying out Gantt charts, and like, what's a Gantt chart look like? It kind of looks something like this. Right? You generally have phases. You've got all these bars. You might see you know, different things that connect them. This red line here is sort of indicating sort of a where we are in time. Right? Um, and, and real complex Gantt charts, you'll start to see predecessors and successors, basically meaning like, what do I have to get done before I go to my next one? How do things link together? Um, this would be sort of your detailed Gantt chart. In other programs, we start to look at things we call them like a high level schedule. What would that look like? It would be similar to if we took that Gantt chart and we broke it up into just, it's one, two, three, four, five chunks, and then we laid out those five chunks into high level phases, and then we just gave some major milestones along the way. We said, hey, trust me, there's some work that's happening in here. I've got all that detail. And you know, this is sort of what the high level schedule looks like. Generally speaking, when we're presenting on projects and we're presenting on things like schedule, we often will do something more like this. And then this we'll do in more of a, a sit down meeting where you pull up you know, eye charts and really dive into it. Who's heard of agile development? Now we're starting to see more hands. Uh, I would expect that with this group. Who can, in just a few words, describe for me Agile development? Yeah? Yeah, there's a scrum master who runs the meeting and makes sure everyone gives their update. Usually they work in sprints, where like two week intervals where you work on a certain feature for two weeks. Yeah. Like the general gist of it. Yes, yeah. So, great definition or great example. So, um, surpri not surprisingly, as you described, one of many different implementations of Agile development, right? Called Agile Scrum. So great, great example. Fundamentally, Agile is not waterfall, right? In its fundamental fashion, it's not waterfall. The key aspects to Agile are that we're looking at our highest priority items first, and we are trying to streamline our team's productivity, the effort that we're putting into our projects. So what does that mean in the Agile terms? It means that there are four basic values that come out of what they call the Agile Manifesto. Think about what I just described from that waterfall and look at some of these. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It's about your customer. It's about that validation, right? Making sure you're delivering what your customer wants as opposed to saying, this is the flow. I can't, I can't test it because I'm still in design phase. It's about those interactions. 
It's about, in this case, they talk about working software. Agile kind of was born out of the software world, right? We could talk about now how we can apply Agile to all projects, right? Working things, demonstrable things that I can get my customer or my sponsor to say, yes, that's what I want. Customer collaboration, obviously, over contract negotiation, right? And saying, listen, I have this list of things that you want. The priority can change, but the line's still going to get drawn. You might change it and say, I want this. That's okay. I'm not going to go back to my contract and say I wasn't going to do, you know, requirements 9, 10, and 11. I'm willing to do them. But if I do them, then I'm no longer going to do requirements 7 or 8 because you've now changed that priority. And then, of course, then as that happens, being able to respond to those changes, right, as opposed to being stuck in your rigid plan. This is the idea of Agile. And what we described is one implementation of that. So there are two, what I would classify as maybe the most common ones, one very common, the Scrum, which we just heard about. The Scrum Master, who manages sprints, right? Those sprints traditionally are roughly two week periods. It's kind of an industry standard. You can modify those depending on how you, how you run your teams. The Scrum Master is sort of your, like your project manager, right? They're identifying what are your highest priority items? How are you gonna bring them in? Bring them in, assign them to your team. Everyone works on it for two weeks. At the end of those two-week period, you do a reflective or a retro, uh, retrospective to think about, did you perform the way you wanted to? Did you get everything done? What was your effort like? And how can you streamline that performance? Kanban, on the other hand, Kanban talks a little bit more about like process flow. I, I like to visualize Kanban as like a, a manufacturing process where I've got cars going down a manufacturing line. I know the frame happens here and the doors happen here. And then I get to the paint booth over here. And maybe I know that my manufacturing line can take, you know, four different frames at a time. I can attach doors to all of them at the same time, but I've only got one paint booth. So how do I optimize my time and my resources and my manufacturing flow so that I can pump out as many cars as possible knowing that, that, that flow of operations? Sort of the idea behind Kanban. If you want to read more about these, you can, talk, you can certainly go out to Agile Manifesto, kind of talks through some of the different principles, it kind of breaks down all those core values into many different principles, and you can read on the internet about all the different implementations. These two are the two that are probably most familiar and the things that we like to implement. Here's a, maybe a visual then of sort of, I would call it sort of a, a mixture between Agile and Kanban. So an example might be you've got all of these tasks identified Right, you've got tasks that are then they're, um, the priorities or the, are, are identified. So this is like, where does your customer rank these in terms of importance, right? You can lay them out then in this almost Kanban flow of different phases. Uh, it's kind of, you can't see in this one here, but it might be something like you're in detailed design phase one, and detailed, or phase two of detailed design phase one, and so on as you go down. So you could think about this whole Kanban and Agile and Scrum kind of all coming together and saying, I'm going to manage these projects. I'm trying to work on as effectively, as efficiently as I can, and then get my customer to validate what I'm doing as I go through. Is everyone following me so far? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Mapping. Yeah, so the, what tool? So I actually have on our last, I think I put it on my last slide, maybe I took it out. Um, so these here are snapshots from a tool that everyone here has access to in this room. It's called uh, Microsoft Office 365's Planner application, right? So the Planner app. Now the really cool thing with the Planner app is you can lay things out in a Kanban form. You can create your backlog, right? In Agile terms, the backlog is your to-do list, right? You can pull them in, you can assign owners, you can assign due dates, the only challenge here is you can't define very easily effort. That's the one challenge here, right? So it's very difficult to look at this task versus this task to say, how many late nights is this one versus this one, right? And one of the ideas behind Agile when we're starting to define, define these activities that we have to do, they call them stories, we typically assign them what we call story points, right? Those story points are sort of a measure of magnitude of effort. Not hours, they're not equivalent to hours, they're just a measure of magnitude of effort. We're not going to have time to jump into that today per se, uh, but the whole idea behind defining those story points is again to measure your team's productivity. Right? So as you're managing your project as a project manager, the important thing to remember is that not every project is created equally. 
right? I can't just look at it and pick 12 people out of this room and say that I'm going to be able to complete all eight of these tasks by next week. Any random 12 people out of this room might be able to do 16 tasks or they might do less. So every team performs slightly differently and it's your job as the project manager to figure out how well your team performs, determine how you measure that against say your story point allocation. So the magnitude of effort for each of those tasks and then you can start predicting performance and there's a lot of other tools that actually require licenses, tools like Jira, right, where they will actually do uh, velocity maps, right, where you can see I'm on this track here and if my team lowers its performance over time, I, you know, I might expect to be here in terms of story point completion or I might, I'm, I'm waving my hands, so you would look at something like this and if I'm here in time, Jira, where this is story points and this is time. Right? And you might say, well, here I've completed this many story points over time with my team's performance. If I were to take a snapshot in time out in the future, based on my team's past performance, right, here, performance, then I might predict that, you know, same performance, I'll be roughly here. You know, lower performance, I might be here. And better performance, I might get here. Okay? So there are some tools that do a lot more predictive things. Yes? Online, we had a question. How do you recommend the manager to extract effort data from a projection of duration? A manager to extract effort data from, ah, so, well, past actuals or historical actuals are the best way to, to then predict how you're going to perform in the future. I think if I understand the question correctly. I think so as well. Maybe within the context of like the Ninia challenge where it's a new team, you're just getting started, you really don't know how everyone's going to be performing yet. Yeah, so in a new team, so one way to do it, if you're not into the story point definitions or whatnot, um, what you could do is you, you could do a couple different things. You could certainly investigate how do you assign story points. Again, it's a little more complex than what we could cover here. If you were to just do it in simple hours format, you could sit down and look at a list of tasks. And with your team, you could say, how many hours do you think you will work on this task? And then it's up to your team, right? And again, our predictions and our plans are only as good as the data we collect. You of all people should know that, right? So then your team goes off and then tracks the hours that they're working on a particular task until that task is done. Then you compare your actual hours against your planned hours, and you will then get sort of an assessment as to whether or not you are coming in or uh, either at, above, or below your plan. So if I were to ask this team here, how many hours do you have that, uh, you know, in total to do all of these? And they said, well, we, we estimate all of these to be you know, an hour a piece, right? And then I look at it and I say, well, it looks to me like you guys all spent 10 hours on these things last week. Guess what? You, over, you overran your budget, right? So in a real life world, you overran your budget, that's bad. And, uh, and in a world here at Penn State where you're students, well, maybe you're not getting paid for it, so who really cares? It's just more late nights. But you should care because when you get to here and you said, hey, every one of these is an hour, well, guess what? All right, if you're getting down to a deadline, the deadline's tomorrow, right? You probably need to plan on more than an hour because your plan was flawed over here. And that's where Agile comes into play because Agile will take a look at these and every retrospective, right, every end of our sprint period, we look back on our time and we say, how did we perform? And then we reassess our plan. And we might say, you know what? Um, you know, sometimes we adjust the, the effort associated with these. In other cases, we look at our team and we say, my team can perform 15 hours of, of, of successful work every single period. So I'm not gonna bring in any tasks that are more than 15 hours for my next sprint period, right? Because that's just thinking that I'm just gonna be more productive than I am. Does that help answer the question, hopefully? I think so, thank okay. you. Very good. With that, oh, who's supposed to do jumping jacks at 25 after? We're a little behind, but that's okay. We're gonna play a game, no push-ups. Sorry for anyone who's hoping for push-ups. So online, hopefully, we'll, we'll let you kind of watch the group and uh, we'll do the best we can to pull you in for our game. Okay, so here's our game. Everyone here is gonna work in a single team and you have one simple goal. <laughs> it's to move balls. Okay? But I have rules for how you move them. Every ball must have air time, which means I can't just hand it to somebody. It has to have air time. It goes in the air. Every ball must be touched by every member of the team. 
They're all one team. However, they cannot be passed to your neighbor immediately to your left or right. Then, as the ball works its way through your system, it must return to the same person that introduced that ball to the system. If you drop a ball, that ball will be considered a defect. You may not retrieve it, and that defect will count against your total ball movement. So if you move 20 balls successfully and you have five defects, your success rate is 15. In total, we will do five iterations, two minutes each, and we're gonna plan our project or plan our activity, how many balls we think we're gonna move, and then we'll assess how we do. So, starting in 10 seconds, I will allow you all to form your team, and then in two minutes, I will need an estimate of how many balls you will move for iteration number one. Are we ready? A quick question. Yes. What's the maximum number of bins for that? Uh, almost the whole bag. I think it was like 70 was the max okay. number. Seven. I think you gave 70 that year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a project manager. I'm not sure I want to work for, but. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You may form your team. You have two minutes. Wait, 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 one team. Well, I thought we were one team pool. Yeah, form your team. But you have two minutes to form your team and give me a number. Aren't we all? Oh my God. All right, so I'm going to throw them all up. We are, we are, I'm sorry, we're out of time. But I'm happy to stay as long as you guys want just have a few minutes to talk. So let's maybe go two or three minutes until someone kicks us out. Uh, what did you learn? What did you learn today? Either, you know, well, maybe focus on the game. What did you learn about, yes? Discussions are very important. Discussions, very important. Yeah, so we, we call that in leadership, in our leadership classes, we call that communication, right? But here's the funny part about communication. I've interviewed hundreds of engineers, and I was, it's my favorite question to ask, what is the most important part of a team? Everyone says communication. But yet when I go back and look at all the teams that fail, teams here at Penn State, teams at Lockheed, teams other places, why did they fail? Poor communication. So I would take it one step further to say it's not just communication that's important, it's effective communication. It's figuring out how you do communication on your teams that's really important, right? Because we all know it's important, but yet if teams know, it's not like people walk into work every day and you're like, I <laughs> can't wait to screw this up. Right? So they, they know what communication is there, they just don't know necessarily how to do that effectively. What else do we learn through this? How about in project management? I'll go with okay. You gotta push it into production right away, so you gotta get, you kinda get rolling, right? Yeah, so now, you don't have to. Oh, you don't have to. So you don't yeah, have to so push it in, but you do, you do have, you have to have a plan, but you gotta sometimes go, right? You can't get in that vapor lock. I do agree you gotta get into production, but you know, you're right. You should have a plan when you go into it. Yeah? Open to change, you shouldn't be sticking to just one idea and try different variations. Got to be open to change, right? You have to be able to adjust and adapt, especially in Agile, right? I saw a hand here and then over here. Well, we start iterating in the middle of the thing, so you could definitely iterate while you're in production. You could. You could actually tweak a little bit, right? There's certainly you can do in-process improvements, <laughs> yep. Uh, over here first, yeah. Uh, you need to know the weakness and the strongness thing in your team. You need to know your team. Yes, you need to know your team, right? So you have to be able to know your team, the strengths, the weaknesses, right? Play the people's strengths and protect them from their, from their weaknesses, right? It's not always about everyone says, oh, we got to develop everyone. Everyone has to get up to a certain level. Not always true. In engineering leadership, it's one of the things we teach is sometimes you have to know where people are really strong and play to those strengths. And if you know they're really weak, don't put them in situations where they're going to fail, right? Because they're going to fail your team. A couple other hands. Uh, here in the middle first. Um, when you're doing your retrospective, it's important to identify like what worked, what didn't work, what you learned, and like what you need. The retrospective is super important. So now as we look back at this, I mean, look, let's look at our metrics. I mean, the numbers are there. We're all data scientists or artificial intelligence people, right? We're looking at numbers. The numbers are right there. We went from a productivity when we started of a net minus four to a 24. Right? And that doesn't happen by just, you know, circumstance. That happens by communication, by learning, by retrospectives. It's that iterative process. That right there describes why we don't define a plan and then go through waterfall and then get to an end and think that when we're done, we're done. 
right? That iteration is hugely important for not just being able to deliver a product that your customer wants, but to be able to do it efficient, efficiently. What else do we have? A couple other hands in the middle. Yes? Once you have a good system going, you can really increase the production. Once you get the system, yeah, you can really start to ramp it up. Now, what we didn't get to see here is if we have more time, right? Systems then, they do typically start to find a plateau, right? You will find a plateau. And what you will discover if we were to run this exercise a little bit longer, right, is you will discover that if you push it too hard, you will actually start to nosedive, right? So you will nosedive. You can't just, you can't push a team super hard, right? They will eventually, and every team's different as to where that plateau happens, right, before they start to nosedive. So as project managers, you have to recognize that, right? You can't all of a sudden tell your team, hey, we're doing really good, we hit 24, I now wanna take us from 25 in our plan to 75, right? It doesn't work that way. You can't just add more, and you can't sometimes, sometimes people have this, this uh, thing with project management, think resources. If I put more people on it, I'll get it done. That doesn't necessarily always work. How was that, working in a group of 20 or 30? Hectic. Sometimes. Chaotic. It's fun, but it can be chaotic. It can be hectic. It's like, oh, right? You were a self-forming team. I didn't tell you. I didn't give you assignments. I didn't assign a team leader. I didn't assign someone to be the starter. I didn't assign, assign someone to be the end of the line. You guys all formed. You figure out how you were going to arrange yourselves. I didn't tell you even how to arrange yourself in the room. You all figure that out. But you also discovered that in really large teams, right, it can be sometimes chaotic to figure out that formation. Right, but once you get the formation, how you optimize it then will make will drive success. Um, so the question I have to you is obviously depending on the, the teams. There are sometimes there will be teams where the Picoli or your coworkers don't get along with each other. Mm -hmm. So in a situation like that, how do you think that affects the performance of the team? And in addition to that, as a project manager, what can you do to improve the relationships between the coworkers and to make sure that everyone is performing well optimally? So that's a super loaded question that take me a long time <laughs> to answer. But I, the, the short answer to that is really understanding personalities, understanding personality styles, and then going back to where we started in the beginning, which is understand strengths and protect from weaknesses, right? And if you know where people are really strong and you have the ability to play to their strengths and then protect them from their weakness, their weakness in this case being their ability to interact and, and, and work with another coworker, then it's your job as the leader to kind of make sure that that kind of stuff doesn't happen or you come to some sort of resolution. So it's either a separation or a, you know, a, a, a sit down and figure it out kind of moment. It's kind of a short, fast version. I'll do a couple other things and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Any other thoughts? Any other things you learned from this exercise? Yeah. Well, I mean, like in this, where it was like a big team, like you said, if, if people want to like compare it to maybe like a big software team, and support to have like multiple different leaders, for example, like a technical leader or design lead, test lead, which would be good, but like someone taking charge in this corner versus this corner versus that corner is like kind of. Yeah, yeah, so now you're starting to think about how do you create sub-teams, right? How do you optimize the flow? And that's where, again, if you ha we had more time and we wanted to do more iterations, you could get into this idea of, of multiple sort of team leaders that would kind of break up and figure out how do I optimize the flow within my subsystem, right? Or my, my sub-team. So that's great. So yeah, so we look at these numbers, right? I mean, that's a couple of the big things that we kind of took away. Was we were all over the map a little bit in terms of what our plan was and how optimistic we thought we would be in terms of our, uh, what we would achieve. What's really important is this, right? Is this is our team learning, right? The team learning phase of driving those defects, you know, oh, you know, crud, we got all these high defects. We start to learn how to operate as a team. We're driving those defects down. But what's really interesting is not only did you drive defects down, right? But you processed way more balls. And I think about that, right? I mean, just the, again, in productivity standpoint, it wasn't like you went in with a plan of 30 and you processed 40 balls and dropped. 30 of them, you only process through the first one 13 balls. And then the last one, you process 31. Same team, right, just learning from one another. It's that iterative process. Any last comments or questions? Yes? In this case, I do feel that having a team leader would have made things worse, simply because it's too fresh and everyone wants to be heard. I don't know, make sure that maybe if someone had a better idea, that could have been suppressed because there was one person in charge. So yeah. in this case, I think it was a good thing that we didn't have one person who was heading the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. And so actually, there's some really neat studies and stuff, on, and actually some things that I've done and some experiences that I had where we didn't necessarily have a team leader, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so there's some neat ideas and, and around sort of like this idea of maybe like team leadership and and maybe not necessarily having a titled leader for a team, but still having super productive teams or super efficient teams. So yeah, that was great. And so that kind of feeds back into that whole idea of self-forming. All right, well, I'm sorry I ran over. You guys were awesome. I went a little bit long. I knew I was gonna do that in the beginning, so sorry about that. 
My only last one is to say thank you again for having me. I would really appreciate feedback on this. It takes like two seconds if you've got a second with your phone to just fill that out and uh, you know, let me know your thoughts. I'm happy to hang out if you have questions. Otherwise, uh, unless you have um, other things you need to cover for your club meeting tonight, have a great evening. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can, sure, I can send that. So, so, <laughs> so, our, our, uh, so again, I mentioned I'm the director of our engineering leadership development program. Um, that program is, uh, is for you all, I'm assuming most everyone here undergrad, I did meet one graduate student. We do have a, a minor um, and a certificate at the graduate program as well as a graduate degree. Uh, but primarily our program is the undergraduate minor, so it would be applicable to you all. That minor consists of essentially six classes, two of which are gen eds that are pretty easy to align to your core curriculum. Um, it is open to everyone, um, even though it says engineering leadership. Uh, I did talk to some students from IST and others, right? So you're certainly welcome to take the minor. Uh, the only challenge is we don't advertise to your school, your colleges, right? Because it is a little bit challenging with uh, enrollments, but um, as soon as you're able to be eligible for the program, you take form engineering 408. So 408 is our entrance class, gets into the minor. From there, there are three additional classes. So four total that are specific to ELD, and they span everything from um, engineering uh, leadership, engineering entrepreneurship are the two core classes, and then we've got a slew of electives that would include things like project management, which is how I got connected to you all tonight uh, through one of our other instructors and our associate director, Dina, who runs our graduate program, uh, as well as electives in um, uh, things like international partnerships, right? So we do international teaming. So if you're looking at, hey, I want to work with a, a team out of Switzerland or a team out of South Africa, we do technical projects with them throughout the semester, and then we typically travel and see them. So we'll send a group to South Africa over spring break and another group to uh, Lugano, Switzerland uh, in May. So yeah, happy to talk more about the program. I can send some literature out that you can share with the group then afterwards as well. Uh, but if anything you want to remember, 408, that's the course to get in. That opens up access to all the rest of the courses. And uh, yeah, thanks, good plug. <laughs>